Assalamu alaikum. Welcome. I'm not hearing much of a response. I know you guys don't have mics. Assalamu alaikum. Oh, mashallah, mashallah. That's amazing. Um, Bismillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulullah. Welcome, welcome to our talk show. We're happy to have all of you here. Alhamdulillah. My name is Lubna Mullah, and I'm excited to uh, be the moderator for our session today. Alhamdulillah. So today's talk is called. Islam, homosexuality, and self-identity. And just a description for today's session, inshallah. Many Muslims today are seeking a way to respond to the question of homosexuality that is both principled and compassionate, particularly when it comes to fellow Muslims who may be dealing with same-sex inclinations. At the same time, Muslims, like all members of society, are constantly being bombarded from all quarters of society by a strident and increasingly aggressive gay affirmative public discourse that presents itself as the only reasonable, just, or even moral response to the phenomenon of human same-sex desires and attractions. It is no wonder, therefore, that Muslims, both those who experience same-sex attractions and those who do not, have recently begun ceding to this pressure at the expense of their religious integrity and Islamic moral commitment. With very few voices to counter this dominant narrative, many Muslims today have become sincerely confused and troubled over this issue. It is no longer and really never should have been acceptable that we sweep this issue under the rug. We are losing far too many of our brothers and sisters because of the lack of creating a community master plan to encounter the issue both from inside and outside. So Alhamdulillah, I'm very excited to introduce our esteemed panel of speakers scholars and community members alhamdulillah that is going to address this subject for us alhamdulillah so first i'm going to introduce uh first ustada hussein mujaddidi uh, ustada hussein is the co-founder of mental health for muslims it's a site dedicated to providing mental health related content tailored for the muslim community she served the american muslim community for over 25 years mashallah as a spiritual advisor public speaker, mental health advocate, interfaith organizer, and much, much more, mashallah. She currently teaches Islamic studies and Quran, as well as regular educational workshops on social emotional learning to Muslim youth for local Islamic schools in the San Francisco Bay Area. Please welcome Ustada Hussain Mujaddidi. Okay. And next we have Sheikh Abdurrahman Badawi. He hails from Brooklyn, New York. Mashallah, he received his Islamic education at Umm Al-Qura University in Mecca, Saudi Arabia, where he first studied the Arabic language before moving on to a degree in Islamic law and legal theory. Abdurrahman, Sheikh Abdurrahman is now serving as the resident scholar and youth development leader at Mass New York, where he teaches several Islamic classes and youth programs. Please welcome Sheikh Abdurrahman Badawi. You have some fans in the crowd, mashallah. And I'd also like to welcome Sheikh Mustafa Omar. He's my neighbor, relatively speaking, in SoCal, alhamdulillah. Sheikh Mustafa Omar completed a BS in Information and Computer Science from UC Irvine, a Bachelor's in Theology and Islamic Law from the European Institute of Islamic Sciences in France, and an MA in Islamic Studies from the University of Gloucester, I think I pronounced that correctly, in the UK. He also studied the Islamic sciences for one year at Nadut al-Ulama in Lucknow, India, and spent another year studying in Cairo, Egypt. Sheikh Mustafa also later completed the traditional iftah program at Darul Iftah in Birmingham, UK, mashallah, granting him the traditional title of Mufti or specialist in Islamic law. He currently, um, he currently is the religious director at the Islamic Center of Irvine, an executive member of the Fiqh Council of North America, and a senior fellow at the Yaqeen Institute. Please give a warm welcome to Sheikh Mustafa Omar. Barakallah fikum. Okay, I'm, I'm looking forward to an engaging discussion. I'm going to be asking um, a list of questions to our panelists, and I'm going to start off with Sheikh Mustafa Omar, inshallah. 
could you please tell us what is the Islamic ruling on freedom of choice when it comes to disposing our sexual desires in general, even in the heterosexual uh, relations? Sure. <clears throat> Bismillah rahman rahim So, you know, when it comes to this idea of freedom of choice, you know, people really have this notion of being promoted, this idea of love is love. And if you, as long as you're in a consensual relationship and both people are fine with it, there should be nothing wrong with that relationship. Islam, as well as most people in the world, do not actually accept that notion in its absolute sense. So there are restrictions when it comes to relationships. First of all, relationships outside of marriage, right? You cannot have a romantic or physical relationship in Islam outside of marriage without actually getting married. This is something that most people throughout the world and throughout history, I think they've understood this, right? Today, people are not putting so much emphasis on marriage, but it still exists. Uh, the idea like words like fornication and adultery, they almost sound archaic. It's like people don't even know what they mean anymore. But you know, there are still people who value marriage and value family values. But beyond that, there are other types of relationships which can be consensual but they're still not allowed in Islam. And not only are they not allowed in Islam, they're not allowed in the majority of world, world religions. They've not been allowed in the majority of societies throughout history. Let's take a few examples. If you have a relationship with your mother, your father, somebody comes and says, I wanna marry my dad. I wanna marry my mom. Most people throughout history, and until today, they'll be like, no, that's wrong. Wrong means immoral. And not only is it wrong, they say, that's gross. Why would you want to marry your mom? Why would you want to marry your dad? And that's called incest. And incest is viewed in Islam as being immoral. And universally, it's been, and for the most part, it's still considered to be immoral. So that's a relationship which is not allowed regardless of consent. Another example would be having a physical romantic relationship with an animal. This is called zoophilia or it's called bestiality. This idea, for, the, for most of human society, people would be like, that's wrong, that's gross. I mean, if somebody brought you know, a horse or a dog you know, to a restaurant and said, this is, my, I wanna, I, this is my partner, we got married. You'd say, you can't have a relationship with an animal outside, that, uh, you know, outside of humanity, even if it's consensual. Regardless of you know, whether the animal's consenting or not, that's a whole other philosophical discussion, right? Take another example, necrophilia. Necrophilia basically means that you're having a relationship with a dead body, physical romantic relationship. Now, if someone were to just come along and make the argument, and some philosophers do, they say, yeah, but you don't know if there's consent there. If somebody left behind in their will and say, I'm allowing you to do this after I die, the majority of people in the world today will say, that's immoral, is wrong, and it would elicit an emotional response and say, that's just sick. You know, why would you do that? Islam has the exact same rules. That, you know what, there are restrictions in relationships. Incest is not allowed. Zoophilia is not allowed. Necrophilia is not allowed. And to add to that, homosexuality is not allowed in Islam. Now, universally, this is something that had been, for the most part, throughout history, just like all the other things that I mentioned, it's been viewed as something that is immoral, and it's been viewed as something that is gross. It's, something's wrong with it, something's not right. And what happened is, there's been two times in human history as a society that's been normalized. One was the time of the people of Prophet Lut, which I'll get to later, and the second one is today. And that really started where if you look at history, the majority of people 40, 50 years ago throughout the world would say this is not a normal, acceptable relationship to have a man with a man and a woman with a woman. But what happened is in America, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, which is like the Bible in you know, psychotherapy, version two, it was listed as a sexual deviancy and they had categories of this. And then in 1974, the gay rights lobby came along and put pressure on them and they removed it and they modified it and they said only it's a sexual deviancy if it bothers you internally. And then later on, it got completely delisted in the DSM-3 and the DSM-4 and the DSM-5 now that we have today. So 
Islam's stance is pretty much that you can have, you can choose your partner. You have a freedom to choose who you want to marry, who you want to have a relationship with within the boundaries of decency, within the boundaries of morality that God has set. And the majority of people throughout history have understood what is right and wrong on this issue. And just to be clear, when we're talking about homosexuality, you're talking about practicing it in an intimate sense, not having the same sex attraction. Yeah, and we're not talking about just desires. We're talking about the actual practice of having a physical romantic relationship and actual relations with the same person, yes. And I think that clarification is, is really important. And to continue with Sheikh Mustafa, can you also tell us, so we're going to you know, uh, narrow the scope a bit further, and I, you kind of mentioned it, but just again to be clear, what is the Islamic position towards same-sex activities? So, like you, we've already differentiated. There is same-sex attraction, which is not intrinsically you know, forbidden in Islam, because you can't control a natural tendency that just crops up in your mind. But in terms of a same-sex practice, in terms of having a physical relationship, a romantic relationship, Islam is actually very clear. And that it's three things. That it's forbidden, but it's not just that it's forbidden. It's very important for us to go beyond that. Some Muslims stop and they go, tell me the legal answer, you know, uh, mufti, Islamic scholar. And they're like, it's haram, period. This is not the way to look at it. It's beyond that. It's prohibited, and it's prohibited for a reason and a wisdom, and that's because it's called a fahisha. And fahisha means it's a type of indecency. It's a type of something where it's like a shameful type of behavior that is not good or beneficial for society or for individuals. And number three is that it's unnatural, meaning that most people understood this. So where do we get all this from? If you look at the Quran, the story of the people of Prophet Lut, Prophet Lot is mentioned in about 105 verses. This was my count, right? And one of the places in Surah Al-A'raf where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions it, He says, He says, remember when Prophet Lut said to his people, are you engaging in a shameful, lewd behavior that nobody else in the world has preceded you before? And then he clarified it, right? He says, uh, uh, what, What's the verse? Um, uh, uh, that you are coming to men lustfully lustfully instead of women no you are people who've gone too far in your immorality in your transgression so there's three things we glean from this number one is Prophet Lut is saying don't do this because it's wrong the haram forbidden part the second thing he's trying to say is that This is fahisha, meaning what's wrong with you? Why would a man want to go after a man? Something is obscene about this. Something is not right about this. So there is a, a moral condemnation built in explaining the, the prohibition along with the wisdom behind that this is not the way Allah created you and this is not a good way to structure your society. And number three, مَا سَبَقَكُمْ بِهَا مِنْ أَحَدٍ مِنَ الْعَالَمِينَ Nobody as a society There may be a few individuals. Nobody as a society has normalized this like you people have. And if no one else has done it, normalizing this as a society, it means that it's unnatural. It was not part of God's plan. It was not part of the plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That, in a nutshell, is what Islam's stance is on same-sex acts and homosexuality. Jazakumullah khair. Barakallah feek. Appreciate that. Ustad al-Husayn, could you please tell us how should we as Muslims address same-sex attractions and activities within the Muslim family and the Muslim community, please. Alhamdulillah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Jazakallah khairan uh, for the question. Jazakallah khairan. First and foremost, when I, you know, um, am speaking on this topic, I always want to preface and say the most important thing that we have to remember is that we are an intellectual community. So our response to everything that's happening all around us should always be rationalized and not reactive. So we have to remember that. That's a very key component. And one of the think, concepts that I think we all understand uh, in this regard is uh, the, the concept of sabrun jamil, right? What is sabrun jamil? We usually associate it with uh, loss, death, grief. 
But what it really is, it's teaching us regulation of our emotion, right? That in the face of a tribulation, in the face of something that we can't comprehend, we have to pause think, allow our emotions to subside and allow Allah subhanahu to call on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and make sure that we are again engaging our intellects and not in a reactive state. So that's the first point that I think we have to remember because I know working within the community there's a tendency to immediately jump into a very hyper reactive state, right? Where it's anger, fear because we're you know afraid of the unknown we're afraid of what what this could mean for the future there's a lot of fear and they're legitimate fears but in that moment it's so important especially when you're dealing with youth and you're dealing with someone who themselves is also confused that you practice again have comportment regulate your emotions and are able to just pause and if you're not ready for that conversation at that time then maybe it's a good opportunity to say I need to process this. I need to think about it. I need to, you know, before we get into the discussion. So I would really warn anyone to not jump into conversations that they're not ready for intellectually. Um, the second part to that would be to really be prepared, you know, and that's where pausing can help because if you're prepared for the conversation, then you will be able to actively listen first. You know, and I'm looking at you know family systems and communities where these things are emerging all the time. We have to be willing to listen, because when our you know whether they're youth or other individuals feel heard, they're also more receptive to listening to your advice, right? But if you're shutting down the conversation because you're angry, or afraid, or you're just immediately jumping into you know, panic mode, you're likely not going to leave room for dialogue. So it's very important that we practice active listening and be prepared also with a informed response, which is then brings us to the second point. We have to be informed about our Sharia. We have to know that we have an ethos in Islam that is grounded. As I mentioned in the earlier session with the youth, Islam's position on this subject is very clear. It is we Muslims who are very confused, but there's a lot of reason behind that. It's a confusing time for all of us. So we have to turn to the experts, turn to those individuals that are, alhamdulillah, leading the way on this, conversa on this topic to be able to seek understanding. How can I properly address this from a place of inf information, right? Not a place of emotion. That's very important. And then the third very essential uh, component is prophetic compassion. Because if we do not practice the first, which is we are you know, forgetting our sharia or abandoning what we know to be true, we're compromising our faith. But if we don't remember prophetic compassion in the packaging, we're compromising our humanity. And neither of those are acceptable. We have to maintain our faith standard, we have to know the faith standard, and then we also have to put into practice what our Prophet ﷺ left us, which is to receive people where they're at, to be a, a, an agent of, of rahmah, and, and well, you know, that you are so clear in your desire for good, that you want this person's well-being, that it translates in the advice that you give them. And again, if you're not ready for that, then pause and seek the help from whoever you can get to get to that place, inshallah. Wait, yeah. And how do you suggest that we address this issue um, in society in general in an unapologetic way? It's a great follow-up question because if you're doing that first part where you're actually intellectually rationalizing this issue and you're not jumping into a fear state, then you will have the information and to be able to stand up for your beliefs, to be able to unapologetically say, I am a Muslim and that is something that is in conflict with my faith. Now that does not translate, and this is something we have to be clear about, when you put, create a boundary, it does not translate that you are somehow a bigot or somehow intolerant. And we have to be very uh, clear in our conviction that anybody who comes back with that idea or that notion is are they, they're just falling into logical fallacies and cognitive biases so this is where studying these ideas knowing how to debate knowing how to uh, rhetoric studying grammar studying logic studying ways of communication that make you sound as you should be a reasoning and compassionate human being will fare much better than again jumping into either a fear anger state or an avoidance state 
which we, again, can't do. We have to stand for our deen. We were brought onto this earth as representatives. We have an amana. You know, Imam Siraj had mentioned in a private discussion to remind all of us that this deen is an amana Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us, that we have to protect it for generations to come. So if we are watering it down, if we are cowering because we are afraid of being, of cancel culture, afraid of being ostracized, afraid of not being welcomed by so-and-so or liked by so-and-so, or losing followers, losing whoever. We have abandoned the, core, the, the main principle of our creation, which is we are here to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to preserve his deen. So all of this has to be understood. And if you get to that place of information, right, and I, I mentioned this again in the earlier session, it is so critical that we understand the history of this movement. This did not just happen accidentally. There is... A, a history that is very, uh, when you you know study it thoroughly, it starts to make sense of how we ended up in a time where these things are so normalized and not just normalized, they are celebrated, they are encouraged, they are there are things that are being. Uh, promoted heavily every single day, every single segment of our society, you will find these ideas being promoted. And we have to wake up and realize that there is, uh, you know, uh, an agenda there, and we also have a responsibility to respond thoughtfully with critical thinking, with reason, and most importantly, with compassion. Jazakallah khair, and appreciate that. Can you suggest any uh, resources, toolkits, for yes. parents and family members, loved ones who Absolutely. have Just people in their families struggling with same-sex attraction. Absolutely. So there are, mashallah, as I mentioned, experts who are leading this conversation. And I will refer to people that I know. I'm sure there may be others. But mashallah, it was mentioned there is a podcast called Away Beyond the Rainbow. And this is uh, produced by Brother Waheed Jensen. Um, and this is very informative. A lot of people have found healing from this podcast. There's also uh, Ustad Mubin Vaid, who writes prolifically on Facebook and other social media, and he's very thoughtful and critically analyzes this issue. It's not an emotional or, uh, you know, quote unquote religious uh, response. It's actually very informed and, and covers a broad range of, of perspectives. And then there's also Dr. Carl Sharif. Uh, I, for, I apologize, I don't know how to pronounce his last name. I think it's Tabgui. If yeah, oh, Tupki. Sorry, it's it's the spelling. I think it might be. Is it Turkish? No, it's a Turkish. <laughs> Sorry for all the Turks. I'm I'm not very well um, read in the Turkish language, but um, his uh, his uh, video on YouTube is available. He did an interview with Brother Paul Williams called "Islam and LGBTQ: Gender, Sexuality, Morality, and Identity." It's a very comprehensive presentation, and he's actually provided the slides for free for his the audience to use. Any educator, parent, or mental health professional is free to use his slides, a very well-researched presentation. And as I said, I'm sure there are others, but I would also caution um, to be very careful about the resources that you look into because there are many people who pos or pose themselves as being Muslim, um, uh, but they actually are, are, are more ideologically uh, aligned with this movement than they are with the tradition. So they will present on this topic and you know, assume to be authorities on it, but they're actually just parroting the same talking points as the ideology itself. They're not giving you an Islamic perspective. They just have a Muslim name or maybe, you know, throw in some reference to Islam. So please be careful. And I would definitely look to also mental health experts like Dr. Rania Awad, who is a dear friend of uh, mine personally, but also someone I look up to. She is working with Maristan, which is a wonderful organization, to really develop, uh, you know, anything and everything on mental health, but from the Islamic framework. And I think we should look to her organization and others who are also leading this discussion from the mental health perspective. Thank you. Appreciate it. Sheikh Abdul Rahman, can you, uh, you know, moving on to Muslim youth now, can you share some, uh, summarize some of the different forms of struggle that Muslim youth face regarding this issue? Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa rasulullah. So there's, there's a number of struggles. I've narrowed it down to, I think, four or so. Uh, number one, of course, it starts from the home. So what I've observed is that the vast majority of Muslims, Muslim youth growing up in their houses, the way this issue is addressed is haram, and that's that. Zero explanation, no further questions. 
And when that happens, of course, it's not intellectually satisfying at all. And there's, there's a, a number of reasons as to why that ends up being the case, but the bottom line is that it doesn't work uh, as well as uh, perhaps it worked one generation ago. So that's number one is that there's no core foundation of understanding why things are haram and um, you know, being satisfied with that intellectually. Number two, another pressure that is faced is now, uh, depending on what state you live in, but I guess it's like across the board, at an increasingly young age now, kids are being pressured and effectively forced to learn about lifestyles and beliefs, and in fact, not just learn about it, but participate in some aspects or activities that at the very least imply acceptance of lifestyles and beliefs that go against Islamic guidelines. And we're talking about young ages where they're not ready to process sexuality or alternative pronouns or any of these things. So effectively at that age, you can call it indoctrinization, where it's like, hey, believe this and that's that. That coupled with the fact that there's no alternative being taught at home, there's no foundation, is it's a recipe for disaster. So that's number two. Number three, it would be, so they get a little bit older, now they're teenagers, now they're in their circle of friends, typically in a public school or even you know uh, otherwise as well. And the average teenager goes just with what the public is, uh, you know, what the public belief is, what the celebrities believe, what's on social media. So now they have that pressure. And that sometimes, that peer pressure is stronger than their parent, their masjid, etc., etc. So they just conform. And then on top of that, their favorite celebrities, athletes, etc., are wearing the armbands and whatnot. That's another pressure. They're, they're, uh, and then social media, traditional media, f fiction, non-fiction, that's another one again. And then finally, and this would be on us, right, and on the Islamic leadership, is that they don't often find strong, unap unapologetic, confident Muslim voices clearly conveying our Islamic position with uh, empathy and compassion, but also very clearly, this is our position and we don't have to back down from it. So those are just some of the pressures that face the Muslim youth daily. Wow. And uh, Sheikh Abdul Rahman, could you also advise us, how should a Muslim family react if their son or daughter comes to them saying that they have same-sex attraction? Um, what is your advice? So, if it, so, within the Muslim family itself. So, obviously, we're not referring to the community. Uh, typically, um, enacting you know bad actions like ostr ostracizing them, which is is also in discussion. We'll talk about it. But so, within the family themselves, uh, first off, I want to just back up a little bit and address the parents who are in the crowd or any aspiring parents. Is that this does not come up all of a sudden? It may appear that way to a, a set of parents because, but that would indicate, frankly, that there's been a disconnect between parent and child for a long time. Uh, people don't develop sexual attraction overnight. Uh, you know, this, it, it brews for a while. There's a lot of theories as to all the factors that go into that. And um, it's, it's a matter of my biggest advice would be to parents is you need to build a loving relationship with your children from literally day one, the day they are born, and make sure that you're the first person they go to with concerns and share their troubles as the troubles start not when it's in the last stages and it's too far gone at that point. So with that said, if a young person is coming to their parents concerned about same-sex attraction, it's a good sign that they're trusting their parents with this, hopefully at an early stage. And I would say first and foremost, dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah doesn't bear you, uh, doesn't give you a burden more than you can bear. And uh, any test that he put in your way, he knows that you can handle. So dua to Allah on a constant level. Uh, secondly, I would say what Ustad Hussain mentioned, she mentioned several resources. I would say start there and start learning because education is key. Uh, as she, as his, uh, our Ustad mentioned, she said also people's first reactions are the worst. It's anger, it's uh, fear, it's all kinds of you know, irrational responses which don't help. And the second part of the question about, well, is ostracizing a solution? It is not. I've never seen that work uh, in any, with any problem. It is, it, all it does is cement and make permanent the rift that is between the parent and the child and make it clear that you throw them to the, to the wind and whoever can pick them up, picks them up. So it, it's not a solution, it's not based on love, it's not based on giving them an opportunity to, to work on this. And finally, I would say is that a child who comes to their parents with concerns about same-sex attraction, frankly speaking, and this might not be okay to say in, in, you know, in, in the society doesn't want to hear it, but they, they don't know yet. They are typically young, maybe they're just mimicking what their favorite character on a TV show or a game now. Or maybe they are just like rebelling against very strict parents you know, a million other things. So there's still things to explore and research humbly and learn. And, uh, you know, I, I make dua for the families going through this and any other problems. May Allah Ta'ala aid them and allow them to succeed in their test. Ameen. Ameen. Zakim al Sheikh Mustafa, can we talk about now 
about controlling and managing you know, sexual desires? How can we respond to the argument saying, these are urges that I can't control? How does Islam teach us to manage these urges? So when it comes to desires, you know, everybody has certain desires that you can't manifest. Right? There's a desire for drinking alcohol. There's a desire when you're a kid, you want to try what pepperoni pizza tastes like before all the halal options came out. You know? There's these natural desires that we have. We can't fulfill all of them. And when it comes to the physical desires, you have the basic tools. The two tools are, one of them is looking away. You say averting the gaze or lowering the gaze or lowering your glance. Right? So not looking at something that you're attracted to and not fantasizing about it and thinking about it and saying, I wonder what will happen and all these thoughts going through your mind, right? So that is your internal thing. Your second thing is be concerned about your consumption of media. What kind of videos are you watching? What type of things are you allowing yourself to see? Because that's just going to further, you know, exacerbate and increase the, the, the desires that you have. And there's fasting, obviously, you know, which is one of those things which helps you curb your desires. But when we're talking about same-sex attraction in particular, right, you don't have marriage as one of the solutions, right? And even though marriage is not always the solution for all desires anyways, let alone, but you don't have that as an option. And what you do need to figure out is because you're dealing with something where it's not the norm for people to be, have this type of attraction. And people don't understand why it's happening and they don't understand what tools they have that they can process one of the best things they can go to is to stories of people who have gone through the struggle, exactly that particular struggle, and see what worked for them, what did they try, what was effective, how did they begin to start to realize why some of these things are happening. I think one of the great websites for that, it used to be a website, now it's a Discord server, it's called straightstruggle.com. And uh, as Hazai mentioned that, you know, Away Beyond the Rainbow is also a great podcast as well. And this is a recovery group for Muslims who have same-sex attraction around the world. And what they do is they share their stories. And when you talk to them, and I've spoken to many of them, you learn a lot. It's very, very interesting. When you hear that there's a Muslim brother who's never been attracted to women in his life, he was always attracted to men, and he couldn't understand what's going on with him. And then all of a sudden, one day he decides to tell his roommates, his Muslim roommates at college, he said, this is what's going on with me. I hope you guys don't abandon me. I've always felt left out. I've always felt excluded. I've always felt different. And these guys, alhamdulillah, decided, you know what? We're gonna help this guy. We're gonna do the opposite. We're gonna include him in every single activity that we're playing, every board game, every gathering. They went out of their way. And the brother said, within like six to 12 months, I started to become attracted like normal to women again. See, like, that's all it took. And it's so interesting because the more of these stories you read, people go back and they start looking at their own past and they say, I can see a little bit of that in me. Let me try to work on some of the other things that are going on in my life. And that's really important. So I think that's very powerful is to look at what other people who are trying to tackle with this issue have gone through and what are some of the things that have worked for them. And the support group is one of the fantastic, straightstruggle.com is a fantastic support group. Another one, which is, is more challenging, here's the challenge that we have today, is that any, any type of official tools that you try and publish, it's gonna be deemed prohibited and banned in this country under quote unquote conversion therapy, right? And conversion therapy, you know, sometimes people have done weird things like, you know, kidnapped their kids and taken them to a forest or something like that. It's horrible. But that's not the only thing that's out there. That's not the only thing that helps people either curb or process their desires or rechannel them in a different way. You have research from Joseph Nicolosi. You have his son, Joseph Nicolosi Jr., who have published uh, he is over a thousand cases. Joseph Nicolosi, he's a Catholic, well-known, he passed away now, he's a well-known psychologist, uh, his son as well. They've been among the few people who have been helping and they have documented cases showing that one-third of their clients were able to actually reverse the type of desires that they had. One-third of their clients were able to reduce the amount of desire that they had and they were able to keep things in control. And one-third of their clients couldn't do it. You know, so it's like if you go to a, a therapist and you have depression or you have anxiety, 
there's no 100% chance of recovery, right? A lot of it has to do with uh, your attitude going in, how serious the issue is, how long it's been going on for, what kind of support group do you have, and do you have a good therapist, you know? And part of the problem today, and I, I wanna bring this up, is part of the problem is you have therapists who are primarily trained in affirmative therapy, you know? And sadly, there are many Muslim therapists who are trained in the same thing. And it's very hard to know which people you send them to in order to get help, right? Because they could potentially have had the same indoctrination going on that the school kids are going through and they're gonna bring that into their practice. So there, there are tools out there and they're gonna come from two sources. They're gonna come from sources of people who've been working on this for a long time, like Nicolosi's or you're gonna come from stories of Muslims and other people who said this is, these are the issues that we've tried and these type of things worked for us. There's usually underlying causes of depression or anxiety, not having a strong father figure in your life, not having stable relationships within your household and so many other things. Processing those challenges in your life is not only gonna help you with this issue, but it's gonna help you with so many other aspects in your life and people don't realize that these things are oftentimes interrelated. So I believe it's very important for us to go to those tools as well. Jazakallah khair, that seems like a very holistic approach, mashallah. Sheikh Abdurrahman, how can we respond to the question from many young Muslims? Why should we Muslims impose our beliefs on someone else if we do not accept for anyone to impose their beliefs on us? Meaning we're going against the flow. How, how do we? Jazakallah khair, I think it's an excellent question. It comes up a lot and it comes from people who are well-meaning. They don't mean it as what it really is, but my response is always a question. I respond to the question with a question, which is, wait, who exactly are we imposing our views on? At what point in all of these conversations and the talks that we've had all weekend, has anybody stood up on the stage and said, we Muslims gotta impose our views on the rest of this country, 99% of the country, it's never happened. All we're doing is uh, demanding the right to have our own view and to disagree. So frankly speaking, the question itself is a fallacy. We're being bullied into the notion that by simply disagreeing, by simply having a different belief, that we are somehow imposing our belief on other people. And it's absolutely not the case, right? In fact, I would say it's the exact opposite. Who is at risk of losing their job by simply claim, saying that they disagree? Who um, gets penalized when they refuse to wear an armband that di dictates or denotes support for other people. I don't see people at schools being forced to wear hijab, otherwise they get uh, ostracized. It doesn't, we're not imposing anything. We're being imposed upon, in fact. And the irony is that the scrutiny doesn't go the other way. So when they're uh, doing this imposing belief on us and so on, you don't, uh, they don't get called imposers and, and uh, you know, um, uh, forcing others to uh, accept your belief and so on and so forth. So honestly, there's a double standard happening here. And it's important for us Muslims to be proud and confident in our belief and be open about calling out this double standard. Do you think we owe support to the LGBTQ community in, in seeking their rights in exchange uh, of them supporting us against Islamophobia or in our global just causes such as Palestine or Kashmir? Right. So I get this question quite often, um, especially from the youth, because you know, it's a moral dilemma, right? You feel obligated when someone is, you know, turning to you and wanting to support you to also return in kind. I mean, these are, you know, principles in our faith to, to, to repay kind with, kindness with kindness. So a lot of people get caught in this, you know, uh, you know sort of uh, dilemma because they're being played, their emotions are being played on. But this is where we have to go back to reasoning. And, you know, it's so important to, again, think of what is exactly being asked of you. If you are being asked to compromise your faith by supporting something that is in complete contradiction to your faith in order for uh, you know, another group to support very legitimate you know, violations of human rights, um, that are clear and I think most sensible people would agree upon, then it's, it is, uh, again, a very deliberate, I think, tactic that we have to be 
mindful of, and we should not fall into those uh, to those uh, pitfalls because that's what they they they, they um, you know that's really what what's happening is that you're being asked to compromise something in order to get something in return. So rather, I would say if that's what is being proposed, no, we don't need the support of anyone. We seek power through Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala first and foremost. So we turn to Him for guidance. We turn to Him for power. And if people choose to support uh, legitimate, you know, very clear, uh, again, you know, in support of, of those who are uh, being oppressed and, and it's obvious to everyone else, Alhamdulillah, they have the humanity, they're displaying their humanity. But if they choose to draw these lines where there's a condition that you have to meet in order for them to do that, then right away you should know that that is a boundary and that is not someone that you need to befriend or in any way engage with on that level. Um, because, you know, if, if something is truly a human rights issue, then I think people, again, of all races, backgrounds, cultures, creeds, will see that it requires a human response and these conditions are not imposed. But uh, when that's, you know, not there, then clearly there is an agenda. So, so yes, it depends on the way that it's being posed, but if, yeah, if it's, if it's asking you to compromise, then no. Sheikh Abdurrahman, how can we support our Muslim community in front of this growing campaign so that we don't yield to the pressure of losing uh, our Islamic in in integrity values? So, as a community, we definitely need leaders to stand up. And I think I want to commend Mass and other organizations for making uh, an effort to make sure that this message is clear in a compassionate, empathetic, but also unapologetic way. Uh, but I also want to address the community because, you know, th this might sound a little bit self-serving from a speaker, but I think it needs to be said is that when an imam, a respected Muslim leader or an organization uh, makes their stance on these type of controversial issues clear and they stick with the tradition of Islam and so on, there's not often as much support as people would like to think there is. They will say it behind closed doors, but they don't go out and support as is needed. And I deal with youth all the time and I find that it's, it's sad that a video clip of a non-Muslim on some podcast echoing our views will get a whole lot more support than if an imam or a respected Muslim speaker has said the same exact views. So that's, that's a problem. So, I mean, the, 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 the Muslim leadership have the same concerns of being canceled, of being penalized, and so on and so forth. So, yes, we can say that it is their job to whether they have support or not to stand up for the truth, and that's true. But like one of our sheikhs said earlier today, don't make it a one-on-one -on -one match with shaitan. Don't, don't aid shaitan against your brother or your sister. Like, help him out. Allah is with the community as they work together. Another thing that we can do is to just keep reminding ourselves, keep having events like this and keep uh, rallying around our stance unapologetically. We have every right to have our belief just like everybody else and keep restating that and reaffirming that while being compassionate and being humane and being respectful to others. And finally, something we can consider, but this is perhaps not my field, is consider allying with other organizations of other faiths and, and non-faith groups that perhaps share some of our family values and our views, but that comes, that's its own can of worms, so that's, it's a con something to consider. Allah. Sheikh Mustafa, uh, let's discuss now how to manage our gatherings. How should our masajid, Islamic organizations, youth centers deal with members engaged in these activities? Any distinction in dealing with individuals promoting, you know, this type of, you know, belief system, I should say? or those just attending our gatherings as Muslims faithfully back to Islam? Yeah, it's a great question. I think there's some common sense boundaries that need to be there in an Islamic space. Whether it's a, if it's a masjid, or if it's a mass ikna conference, or if it's a, something, we need to think about uh, what those boundaries are supposed to be. So if you go to a masjid, and somebody walks in with a shirt that says like, let's worship Satan, right? be like, that's not appropriate to wear inside of a masjid. If somebody says, well, um, okay, can I bring my bottle of wine and put it next to me while I'm praying inside the masjid, but I'm not drinking it, I'm just bringing it with me. You say, look, this, you can't do something like that. You don't, you don't bring something like that into the masjid overtly. That's just disrespectful. So there's a difference between when we're talking about somebody being gay or homosexuality and trans. They're not in the same category. One of them is much easier to deal with. So if somebody's coming and they're saying, well, oh, you know, uh, I, I'm gay and I engage in same-sex acts and I do all of that stuff. You want to come to the masjid? You want to come to an event or something like that? Of course, you're welcome. But what you're not welcome to do, what you shouldn't be doing is you come in with a shirt that's promoting your ideology and 
everyone's children needs to see that and they need to look at that. What you don't do is you don't come to the, the mass conference and you set up a vendor table and you say, you know what, uh, I'm promoting uh, Zina dating service without marriage. Right? That's just, that wouldn't be acceptable because it's against Islamic values. So whatever you do in the privacy of your own home or whatever, that's between you and Allah. Right? But when you're in a public space and when you're in a Muslim space where people are going there and they say there's a certain type of etiquette, there's a certain type of decorum that you need to be observing, then you should respect that decorum. So as long as you're not coming and bringing, if you bring your partner, you know, into a masjid or you walk hand in hand or something like that and you say, you guys need to respect me and we're, we're kissing in public or something like that. You say, look, you're in a Muslim space now. This is not appropriate behavior for that in that space. So if you do that, Alhamdulillah, come to the masjid. You should pray. In fact, you know, Allah is going to help guide you as that's the hope and reconnect with Allah. But if you're not willing to respect the space and you don't care about harming other people in that space, then you're still a Muslim, but maybe that space is not the right place for you. Right? And when it comes to the gender issue, when it comes to trans, I think that's when it becomes more and more challenging. Right? And we've had this issue in our masjid. We had this issue in our Islamic university before. We've had, you know, we had a, a guy come in and he said that he's trans and he was wearing full hijab, full abaya, you know, really properly dressed. A little bit hair came out, he made sure, you know, to put the hair back and everything. But he's got a beard, he's, he's a man. So he comes in and he says, he goes straight to the women's section and he starts praying. And we told him, we said, you know, sorry, you can't do that. Because you're a biological man. You have to be, either be praying in the men's rows or we're going to make an exception and we'll do the intersex thing and we're going to give you your own line. But you can't be praying over there. So we convinced him about that and we said, you need to respect the bathroom too. He said, don't go into the women's bathroom and make wudu. He did. The woman came out furious. <laughs> we got a man inside the women's bathroom. He's not respecting our space. So we eventually, we gave him a private bathroom he violated the rule three times and we told him, you know, we're, we're, we're sorry, you're still Muslim, we'd, we'd like for you to keep praying, but you keep violating the rules of the space. So the thing is, yes, there should be some, there should be a balance between welcoming people into the Muslim space. We should welcome everybody regardless of what background they come from, right? And if there's some type of behavior that's going to cause a problem within the space, that they can control, they should control it. Somebody comes in, I had another brother come in with a tattoo, you know, and people are upset. They said, brother has a tattoo, we saw him in the bathroom making wudu. Well, he can't take off the tattoo and put it in the shoe racks and make wudu and leave it when he comes out. But here, where something, you can make an adjustment, you can make a change, it is very important that people need to realize that if you're not respecting the space, you want everyone else to respect your reality, but you're violating and you're disrespecting their reality as these, I don't even like these term, but this term, then something's not right, right? So I think we should be very clear as Muslims and Muslim institutions, we should have some very clear boundaries. We should be as welcoming as possible with some clear cut boundaries saying, if you, if you cross these boundaries, that's a red line and that's not going to be acceptable because you're harming our community. And we will not allow our community and our events and our institutions to be harmed due to some type of belief that you have. Jazakallah khair and barakallah feek. Ustaz al we don't have much time left, but maybe if each of you can give a one minute kind of final advice, and for you in particular to Muslim families. Bismillah, yes. My advice would be to recognize that this is a test not just for the individuals who are going through this but really for humanity and the way that things are going we are failing we are not doing well and it's because we haven't studied we just as you prepare for any test you have to study you have to do your homework you have to learn so it's so critical that we do the intellectual work necessary to understand what's happening instead of just being in that reactive state so I'm gonna give you because I'm a teacher I'm gonna give you a homework assignment and I hope you'll be okay with it I know you're off the students anyway but for the parents I want you to look up three people. I want you to look up Alfred Kinsey. I want you to look up John Money. 
and I want you to look up Carol Reisman. These three individuals are going to enlighten you a lot on what we're seeing happening today. Look up the myth of the 10%, okay? When you study these things in depth, you will realize exactly what's unfolding in front of you, and hopefully it'll give you that impetus to really protect your families, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us to protect ourselves and our families from the fire. We, it's on our, uh, it's our charge to do that, so please do that aspect. And then the second thing is to please, and I, I know time is up, quickly, please, empower your children to learn how to critically think, how to reason through things, and how to debate effectively. I'll tell you a quick story. I was once asked by a, a, a teen, a mother and a teen, her teen daughter. She said, my teen daughter has been Put, you know, put in a position where she is being ostracized from her friends group because one of her friends came out and this girl basically told this girl, do you accept me as, as part of this you know, demographic? Do you accept my identity? And the Muslim girl was trying to, again, vocalize her beliefs and she said, well, I'm Muslim, this is not in part with my faith. And so this girl basically called her a bigot. She, she said, you are, a, a, you know, a, 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 uh, homophobe, you're a bigot, you're a terrible person, and she made her feel terrible, and she said, I'm going to basically kick you out of our friends group because of all of these things. So this girl comes to me crying, because she's like, what am I supposed to do? I don't know how to d defend myself. So I just gave her a very simple question, and I said, I want you to think about this, and maybe even if you feel strong enough to ask this friend of yours, just say, take any issue that is pretty, you know, controversial when it comes to the Muslim community. The first thing that popped in my mind at that time was polygyny, right? polygamy. We know how a lot of people feel about this topic, right? Many people are outspoken that they think it's something terrible backwards. So I said, I want you to ask this friend and maybe your other friends that if you as a Muslim one day wanted to go to your local, you know, uh, city hall or protest in defense of polygyny being legalized in America, would they come and stand next to you? Would they come and take you know, that position and abandon their f your beliefs to align with you? Likely they would not. So anybody that asks you or puts you in that position to compromise your faith, call them out on the double standards, call them out on the hypocrisies, find a way to think about something that they believe in vehemently and say, would you do that? And this is the way that we empower our youth to challenge these ideas instead of capitulating and being, again, manipulated into these terrible situations where they feel obligated to give up the most sacred thing that they have, which is their faith. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect and preserve all of you. Jazakum Allah khairan. Ameen, Jazakum Allah khairan. Barakallah Fiki. Sheikh Abdul Rahman, what's your final advice to young Muslims? So, I have two pieces of advice for our young Muslims. Number one is that you need to make a fundamental change in how you approach this issue. As of right now, the vast majority of young Muslims approach this issue with the back to the wall mentality, inferiority complex of like, I feel obligated to justify to society this belief before I'm even allowed to have it. We gotta change that. You have a God-given right to your Islamic stance. You are just as American as the next person. They openly, as Ustaz Husay mentioned, they openly disagree with our beliefs and that doesn't make them, uh, they don't feel obligated to justify it to us. You should feel the same way. Stand by your convictions and stand by your faith. And my second and final piece of advice to our Muslim youth is beware of what you consume. All this media that you consume, there's been studies done that the average teenager spends nine plus hours online, social media and, and you know Netflix and all that. The media that you consume controls your mind. It defines your mind, even if you don't perceive it. So these things might not manifest overnight, but they manifest eventually, and they result in the problems that we see today. So may Allah Ta'ala protect our Muslim youth, protect the Iman in our hearts, and unite us all upon Haq. Jazakumullah khair. Uh, Sheikh Mustafa, can you leave us with your last words of advice? No reason. <laughs> oh, oh, it came back on, came back on. Last, last piece of advice, please share with us. So we almost had the lights turned off to like get off the stage. So. <laughs> they brought the mic back on for me. Alhamdulillah. 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 Two points, real quick. Number one, I think it's very important that the Muslim community admits their mistake when they make a mistake. 
And I'll say that 10 years ago, 15 years ago, I think we made a mistake in automatically, out of fear of Islamophobia, automatically allying ourselves with the Democrats or with the liberals or just with liberal values, somehow rightfully so because there was so much pressure from conservatives and Republicans and all of that. But Islam is neither liberal nor conservative. Islam is neither democratic, democrat, nor is it republican. Islam is the middle path. Islam is the straight path. So it's very important for us to realize that we didn't get very much from allying with any particular party if we look back. And some of the compromises we made, I think we need to fess up and admit that maybe that wasn't the wisest decision. And number two, we need to realize that the LGBT lobby is not an oppressed minority anymore. It has now become an oppressive force that is trying to take their ideology and shove it down our throats. And what we need to do... Alhamdulillah. What we need to do is we need to stand up courageously, we need to call out any hypocrisy of tolerance, and we need to support the leaders like Qatar who stood up in the World Cup and said, you can come and try and pressure us, but you're in our home court, and we're going to stand up for that. So let's be brave Muslims. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us and keep us strong. Jazakumullah khairan. Thank you all of you for attending. Sister yes, I'm I want so to make sorry. a quick correction. I want to correct. I said Carol Reisman. It's Judith Reisman. I'm so sorry. I don't know why I'm Thank you so much for attending. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of you. Jazakumullah khairan. Thank you so much to our panelists. Jazakumullah khairan. <laughs>